Well, it is Easter, and we are remembering what Jesus has done on our behalf. And as uh, so remember that, uh, we've sung songs about him and remembering all he's done. But I uh, just want to come to a time of, of lifting him up and lifting ourselves up to him in prayer. Uh, would you join me in prayer this morning? Father, we do come to you this day and thank you that and all the things that are swirling around in our world, uh, the things that, that concern us of, of, of wars and potential wars uh, happening in, in, in lands far distant from us, but also even warring that happens within our, our own boundaries here in, in, in our country, uh, within our communities, uh, animosity and tension with one another. Lord, we, uh, we come before you recognizing that uh, we, we don't have the answers except that the answers are in you, uh, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. That as you come and, and as we remember this story of, of, of your life and your death and your resurrection, that, that all these things come together to remind us of you, the creator of all things, the good Lord, our Father in heaven. You loved us so much. You created us and you've given us a, a perspective on life that demonstrates your love for us. And even as we reflect upon uh, great words of your son that uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever uh, believes in him uh, shall not die but have everlasting life. Uh, this promise of your love visited to us. We're thankful for that. We do ask that you would... Uh, a guide and direct us in the things that are concerning us. So Lord, we, we got many within our midst who are going through difficult times, uh, whether they're relationship problems, marital problems, or, or health problems. Uh, Lord, in particular, remember those who are, are struggling with, with health in these days. Uh, well, the children uh, read the, the basic uh, text for today, which is out of the, the Gospel of Matthew and all the things that were transpiring. Uh, on Good Friday, we looked at part of the story, and, and uh, starting from last week on Palm Sunday, uh, one of my uh, directives was to, to have you read through the, the Gospel of Matthew from chapter 21 through, through 26 and 27 through this weekend, and, and to enter into this story on, 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 in some part. Uh, but it's a mysterious story, isn't it? It's, uh, as, as we left it on, on Friday nights, uh, Jesus had died. Uh, I'm reminded of a, of a photo I seen from our past history from 1948. Uh, in 1948, there was a very pointed victory for the Republican Thomas Dewey over Democrat and incumbent Harry Truman. It was such a sure thing in the minds of the Chicago Daily Tribune that they put out a headline that says, Dewey defeats Truman only for it to not be true. <laughs> uh, the votes eventually went the other way. And, and so for many, as they would have heard that and seen that, they would have been glad to see that their guy won and the others quite sad to see that their guy didn't until things had changed. What's well, a little bit of what's going on in this story as we follow it along here. On, on Good Friday, we see Jesus and his many followers who, who are walking alongside him. Uh, on that Thursday, they would have had that last supper with him and seen him arrested and, and put on trial. And then on that Friday, to be put on that cross, having been beaten to a pulp, uh, hit and spit upon and mocked. And, and by the end of that day, dead and, and buried in a tomb. And for those of his followers there would have been a lot of confusion. Well, actually not so much confusion, but disappointment. That this thing that they'd put their hope on and trust in this person who had been filled with such wisdom and given them guidance and talked so wonderfully and who they thought was going to lead them still to be their king and their Messiah, uh, only for him to be dead. And on the next day, which was the Sabbath, and they could do no work, they waited. But uh, uh, when the sun went down, the women would have gathered the spices needed and come that morning to the grave. And, and those women came to the grave expecting a dead body and finding an empty tomb. The disciples of Jesus, told by this by the women, they go running off to see it. This cannot be. We have to see it for ourselves. They were expecting a dead body, and there was one. 
So much so in, in Luke's gospel as he talks about this, two of his followers, uh, they were headed home to, uh, to, to Emmaus. And as they were walking along the road, they, uh, they, they, they were somewhat dejected. And they met Jesus along the way, not recognizing him. And he said, hey, what's going on? And uh, they said, do you not know what's going on? Are you the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's going on here? He said, we had this, this, this Jesus, and he was a prophet, and we had hoped that he would be the one to rescue Israel. That was past tense. We had hoped he was. But it was dashed because he died. <laughs> he died. And despite the fact that he rose Lazarus from the dead and, and despite the fact that he said to his disciples that he's going to be crucified and then rise again, uh, all, that thing went pa- all that stuff went past them and, and they're not thinking anything about him rising again. But then we come to this story where the women go to the grave and it's empty. <laughs> And they're confused and they see an angel and they're freaked out. And uh, there's this story of the, the soldiers there that were frozen because they were so freaked out about what's going on. And the, uh, the tomb is empty. What does it mean? And Jesus tells uh, the woman there, tell my disciples to meet me in Galilee. Galilee. Uh, they were down in the area of Jerusalem in the south. It would be, it'd be a couple days to get up to Galilee. They would have to work their way there. Uh, what is going out there? And at the end of the story we had the children read today, uh, there is the, the other side of what's going on. The soldiers who, who allowed this grave to be open and uh, the dead one to escape, they say, hey, this is what's going on and we freaked out and, and, and uh, we fell asleep. And uh, there's the sense where the, the Jewish leaders, okay, we'll cover you for this. Uh, because uh, we can't let this go. Let's, let's tell the story that Jesus' disciples came and stole the, stole the body. Uh, there's a couple problems with that. One, it acknowledges that there's an empty tomb in the first place that they have to, to, to deal with. The, the body is not there. And, and second, if there were Roman soldiers who were sleeping, they would have been negligent in their duties. And uh, one of the things about Roman soldiers and Roman hierarchy, they are not very forgiving for such negligence in your duties. And they would have been facing uh, dire circumstances even up to their lives. And, and then the, the third is, why would you come up with this story. I mean, given all that's going to happen and, and the circumstances, I mean, if he, if he really was still dead, why come up with this story? It's not going to make their life easier. This is something that we continue to see as the story goes on in the book of Acts and, and, and beyond, that those who held to this idea that Jesus rose again faced circumstances and, and consequences for believing such thing. Uh, some were killed because of the faith. Some were arrested and beaten. This was not the easy way out. So why do it? Um, uh, J.P. Moreland, in, in, um, uh, in a conversation with Lee Strobel, talks about some things to, to think about as we gawk through this whole story. Uh, and he presents it in the evidence of, of, a, of a, a case without a, an eyewitness. If you have a, a case in court without an eyewitness, you have to rely on other things kinds of circumstances to be able to prove your point. Some of it in, in modern day, well, it would have to do with, uh, with fingerprints or DNA samples and, and uh, substances maybe that were on your body that are similar to the scene. And uh, a, a good prosecutor and, and detectives would ferret these things out to figure out who did it, even though no one saw you do it. And, and uh, <clears throat> Moreland says there's, there's several things that come about in the next days, months, and years that indicates something's going on here. And, and the first of them is that the disciples all died for their faith. Each of the disciples, well, other than John, who, who uh, apparently, this, according to um, Fox's Book of Martyrs, John, the, the, the disciple of Jesus, he didn't die for his faith, but at one point, again, according to Fox's Book of Martyrs, was, was dipped into a, a, a vat of boiling oil and, and somehow survived that and then is exiled to the island of Patmos. 
the rest of them killed for their faith uh, because of their faith in Jesus. Why would you do this if you knew that Jesus was not alive? He had not risen from that. Why would you perpetuate this story? And so the fact that they did this and, and went through some circumstances in their life is at least something that indicates something happened there. Um, uh, another thing is that some of the people who were skeptics during those days, well, they were converted for, in their faith. Uh, James, uh, the brother of Jesus, and, and Paul are converted. Paul was uh, uh, not only a skeptic, he was working as hard as he could to destroy this new belief in these people who were claiming to be followers of Jesus. When Stephen, uh, one of the disciples, is killed by stoning, uh, Saul was there approving of what happened. And he was on his way to, to find more people, followers of the way of Jesus, and arrest them in, in the town of Damascus when something happens to him and, and he changes. And he puts his faith in Jesus and begins to follow him. Another thing is that there's changes to, to some of the social structures. Uh, five weeks after Jesus' death, there's about 10,000 Jews who are followers of, of Jesus Christ now. And they begin to, um, uh, to begin meeting on Sundays. Uh, now, these are social structures that within the Jewish world they would have hung on to because they were important. Jews would meet on their Sabbath was from Friday night through till Saturday night. The, that was the Sabbath, and that would be the day that they would worship the Lord and, and go to their synagogues. But in recognition of Sunday being the day of the rising, the group of followers of Jesus would meet and uh, still claiming to their connections of lifelong faith and promises that they have from the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, they continued to, to follow and stick with Jesus and would change all their social structure. And then other things begin to develop. Uh, the church emerges, this new group of people that, that, that begins to rapidly move around that community but into the surrounding communities and into Asia Minor, into Europe, into the Roman Empire. And they begin to do things like communion and baptism as expressions of, of their faith. That in, in the communion, they're recognizing the death of Jesus, and, and, but that it gives new life. And so they, they take the body and the, and the blood symbolically and, and take within themselves identifying with Jesus. And they baptize, they get baptized into a new life, the old life being gone and the new life coming. This all begin within the church. And then we have even to this day the ongoing faith of believers, often in difficult circumstances. There are followers of Jesus Christ that these days continue to face uh, death, to continue to face imprisonment, or the inability to get jobs and care for their families unless they do the worst of the worst jobs available. Some of them cleaning latrines and needing to climb into them. Some of them uh, having to take care of, uh, of, of dead things and disgusting things. And again, they go through this. It'd be easier to just not <laughs> confess Jesus as your Lord. Things would be much simpler. And yet they continue to stay cognizant and, and, and recognize who Jesus was. And along with that, um, a part of this story too is uh, who brought the news first that, that the tomb was empty? It was women. And in that day, in that culture, uh, they didn't trust women to be able to tell the truth on something. This was just a fabric of that community. And, and so the, the fact that, that they said that, well, the women told us this is, is something that they wouldn't have just made up because that does not strengthen your position within that community. It, again, because the, the, the testimony of women was not something that they found reliable. But they said, well, that's how it happened. This is what we trust in. Jesus is not in that tomb. Mary says, I saw him. This is what happened. The resurrection. Uh, I mentioned uh, Saul, the, the skeptic, who uh, eventually comes to faith and is a follower of Jesus, and, and he writes uh, a good portion of what we call the New Testament. And in writing that, uh, there's a particular section 
that he talks about the resurrection in particular. And this is in the 15th chapter of, of 1 Corinthians. And, and I'd like to read different portions of this because in his mind, this idea of the resurrection, well, it's everything. If, if that's not there, the whole thing falls apart. He, part. He's not the Messiah. He's a teacher who lived for a while and then died like many before him. And so towards the end of this chapter to one of the churches in, in, the, in a city called Corinth, he writes these things. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. He reminds them, this is the gospel or this is the good news, another way of saying gospel. And this is, these are the components that Jesus came and then he died, but he rose again on the third day. And then he appeared to all these different people. The resurrection happens. But if it didn't, there's big struggles. He goes on to write this. This is uh, chapter 15, starting in verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then even Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified, testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. What a thing to describe as he's talking about what faith means. Like, if this didn't happen, none of this matters. Why are we going through these hardships and difficulties if it didn't happen? If we're trusting that, that, that Jesus dies and rose again as a, as a rescue for our sins and it didn't happen, then we don't have that rescue. Everything is futile without this being a fact that has happened and occurred. This is vital. This is, this is how everything stands. Because Jesus came, he died, and he rose again and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. We are alive if that happened, but if not, then, uh, as he says at the end, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are all of us most to be pitied. There's more to this than just living a good life, of being kind and good and, and proper. But it is about something dynamic that happens, a new life that transpires. In his second letter, Paul uh, writes words to this effect that, that, that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, the old has gone, the new has come. New life, a change in hearts and dynamics. And, and we've seen that happen in people's lives. Many of you give testimony about the change that has happened in your life because of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that has moved you from one direction in your life and sometimes, oftentimes, hopelessness or, or, or some despair in what matters in this world to a changed attitude and perspective. Uh, I was reading an a, a interview with a, a fellow named Johanna Cantanacho uh, who is a Palestinian. And a Palestinian who is looking at the gospel through Palestinian eyes. 
A lot of times we, we have a perspective from, from, from a Christian perspective, but also an Israelite perspective. But what does it mean to be a Palestinian in these days, looking and listening to the story of, of Jesus and the, the, the work that God does? And well, So he says this about his life. My family was Roman Catholic, but I became an atheist as a teenager. When I was 19, I had a life-changing experience with God. At 3 a.m., I heard the sounds of bells ringing. When I awoke, I was not able to move my hands or legs. I was terrified. I tried to liberate myself with every possible idea in my mind, but it didn't work. At 5 a.m., I said to God, if this is from you, I promise I will look for you. The moment I said that, I was able to move again. Well, after this experience, I started visiting a small Christian and missionary alliance church in the old city of Jerusalem. While there, I said to God, how come you are the God of Israel and not the God of the Palestinians? I prayed to God. I prayed to give God my heart and mind and then dreamed of a face that brought peace and tranquility to my heart. When I awoke, I felt someone whisper in my ears, Johanna, this is the difference between grace and deeds. If you want to follow me by your own effort, you can't. But if you are in Christ, you are protected and he is my gift to you. Then it reflects upon the things that were going on in the time of Jesus. Where Rome tried to usher in peace by the sword during the Pax Romana, Christ did so by dying on the cross. Where Rome introduced peace by silencing prophetic voices and perpetuating injustice, Christ's peace offers forgiveness by transforming the oppressor's hearts and opening doors for reconciliation with God. And then he writes this, Jesus' resurrection encourages me to see how love, mercy, and equality all point to this new civilization, which Christians are missionaries of. How can we offer justice and true forgiveness in paving the way towards reconciliation? We do so by suffering with those who are suffering unjustly and by by fighting injustice because it hurts both Jews and Palestinians. As Johanna reflects upon life and, and, the, and the, the circumstances he was raised under, seeing all those things through the eyes of Christ, through the sacrifice that he made, not by, by demolishing the, the opposition by the sword, but destroying them by love, by taking their place and dying for them, and then exhibiting his power even over death in the resurrection. As we come to this part of the story and we are invited to enter in to new life that is offered because of what Jesus has done, that this is acceptable, this is available and accessible for all of us, that anyone from any place, Jew or Palestinian, American or Mexican, African, Chinese, the love of God is accessible and offered to you. The things in your life that have hung you up, things that you are sorrowful for, things you've regretted, forgiveness comes because of the work of Jesus. And it's not just for this world, but for the world to come. But in this world, this life that comes makes us alive again, makes us oriented to real life, who God is, and what he's done for us. I want to finish with a song um, by Chris Tomlin uh, called Because He Lives. Uh, I invite you to stand as, as, we, as we sing this.